Good evening, everybody. Uh, as you can see, we're going to do a panel again. Um, if it is uh, it's your first time and you're meeting some of us for the first time, we have Clay Davis, Director of Outreach, Eric Gray, Director of Ministry, Dan DeBruler, Director of Discipleship. Here, we're going to talk about something a little sensitive tonight, guys. So before we go any further, let's, uh, let's make sure we, we cover this in prayer. Uh, Father God, we, um, well, we, we just worshiped you. We asked you, Lord, that your presence would remain with us, that your spirit would rest on us, Lord, that, that these words would be your words and that we would all uh, be prepared to, to leave here um, better prepared for a different season in life, Lord, and that you would be honored in this conversation, Lord, that, that in this discussion, Lord, we would hopefully reveal some, some very useful and helpful things uh, as, as we process different stages of life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, so we're going to jump right into Scripture, and I'm going to bring you to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And it starts out in verse 1. It says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Continues, it says, A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Now, there, there's more to this if we continue to read, but I want to focus on this section tonight. Uh, I want to focus specifically on the time to die, weep, and mourn. And why I want to talk about this, I think it is important um, that this isn't misunderstood. So we're up here tonight because we recognize that we, we get to experience great highs in this walk and great lows. And while we celebrate those highs frequently, we just, we celebrated a great 2023 here at Rockfish Church where we got to see new life celebrated almost every weekend or, or Wednesday, uh, baptisms almost every week here at Rockfish Church. And we, now I came up here three times that Sunday, that last Sunday and gave you guys numbers of where we were. So first service heard a different number. And then somebody spoke to me and said, Hey, actually the number's higher. So I'd come in and in second service and correct it. And then they came back and said, Hey, actually there was more, we didn't count. And then, so third service, I think the total was roughly 245 baptisms alone, not even just rededications that didn't turn into a baptism in 2023. And that is worth celebrating, right? And so we look around and we can, we can witness a year like 2023. We can witness a season like 2023. And we can say, man, everything's going right. The church is healthy. God is good. And then we hit a different season in life. And, and we see a couple people go into hospice and, 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 a, and a couple prayers that we had, but they didn't match with God's plan and, and his timing and, and they didn't get answered the way we wanted and, and we lose some people we cared about and we, and, and we were really believing for healing. And I, what I don't want is when, whenever any one of us or even the church enters a season like that, that we would start to look around and say, there's something wrong. God has left this place. He's abandoned us and, and we've got we've, we've to change something. And, and I, I don't want that to be our reaction. I, I think we need to not fear talking about death, talking about loss, and talking about grief. So, so that's why we're here tonight. Um, so hopefully when we leave here tonight, we'll have a, be a better appreciation for that stage in life. We'll be more prepared on how to handle it if we're the grieving one or the one that has lost. And we'll be better brothers and sisters to those who, who are the, the primary loser uh, of a relationship. And we can bring, we can talk about metaphorically different things, right? The death of a marriage, the death of a dream, the death of a career. But I want to focus specifically on uh, death of, of this life tonight. So we know, again, we're going to, we're going to, on this walk, we will experience loss. We will grieve that loss and that's healthy. We shouldn't avoid it. We shouldn't bear, uh, bury it down deep inside and somehow not, not deal with the subject. And uh, we want to be able to handle it well. We want to be able to handle it biblically with the, the guidance, the example God has shown us. And we need to remember that every healing we are praying for is a temporary healing. So um, no matter what healing we're asking for, we know that each one of our days are numbered. That's the way it is. And we need to, we need to honor and respect that and, and, and trust that, that God has us. Otherwise, we're totally missing the, the faith aspect the belief 
of an eternal life with a, with a loving father. And so we need to keep in mind the necessity, the reminder, what death does for us, that what we do here matters, that, that the message we share here matters. Because now when you believe and you share the faith that we have and you have the father we have and you're promised the same eternal life, now we don't need to fear death the same as the rest of the world. That's one of those things that makes us drastically different than the rest of the world is we don't need to fear death. And in fact, we can, we can have an appreciation for, for that, that winter season in our lives. And so we proclaim an eternal life. We need to believe it. We need to live like it exists. So I want to talk first. There's different sessions or sections of this, this grieving. And so I want to talk, first talk about preparing well. And there's two things we can prepare for. One is preparing for the one we weren't expecting to lose. The accidental death, a car accident, um, sudden, sudden illness, whatever it may be. And then there's the one we see far off. Uh, so many of us know uh, one or many or people in our lives that received a diagnosis and, and that diagnosis is years out from being an actual um, terminal sentence. And so we have an opportunity. There's a mercy there for us to be able to, to live that season well with that person or even ourselves right? But we also want to be prepared for the one that might catch us off guard. And so let's, so let's talk about preparing well first. And, and Dan, you, you had some insights to preparing well earlier uh, this week. So yeah, if you want to jump I, in. I think it really comes down to how we live our life. You know, we just sang that song, um, a firm foundation just a few moments ago. And that whole thing, that whole song is built around the parable that Jesus told of the, the, the wise and the foolish builder. And I, I think preparing well um, is, is how we build our house. It's how we build our life. And I'll, I'll read that parable to you, just in case you don't have your Bible. I don't hear pages flipping. It's in Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. I will say this, um, you know, in, in my family, we bumped into one of those sudden situations, one you don't see coming, you have no idea that, that things are going to happen. But in those moments, in those days, and now in the years following that, I realized that we can, we can sing that song and I can stand next to my wife as we sing that song and see her with tears coming down her face as we sing that song and are reminded that it's because Throughout our life, man, we built our house on that rock. We, we built our lives around Jesus, and that's our foundation. So when I think about preparing well, that's where my mind goes. You know, it, it's, not, it's not about getting enough life insurance, although that's a good thing. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about how you build the reality of your life. And the reality of your life is that it's going to end someday. The reality of those that you love deeply, their lives are going to end. Things are going to happen. But if you're building your house on that rock and that foundation of Jesus Christ, man, I tell you, it changes how everything, when, when it all shakes, it's like that song, I've seen joy and chaos. I've seen the winds blow. But he's never failed me and he's not going to start now. Amen. Amen. You know, we have to, um, we just have to know God. We have to, there's some things about him we have to know. And, and I, I, I love that we're having this conversation during the, this living deep sermon series. We have to be anchored in the character of God. There's some things we have to know about him. Another pastor, a friend of mine, likes to say that God is good and he always and only does what is right. We may not always recognize it as being what is right because it's not the way we wanted it. But God always and only does what is right. And when you can stand on that truth, regardless of what's going on around you, but you have to know that truth before the storms hit. That's why, that's why you're, you're right, Dan, what you're saying is how we build our lives. It's, it's not something that we can run to once the tragedy hits. You can run, pick up your your, your Bible app and search out a scripture or Google a good scripture for this situation and then stand on that in the midst of that situation. Those things already have to be built into your life 
before that the the, the death, uh, the loss occurs. And so, do you guys agree that 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 approach prepares you for both the sudden and the the prolonged mm-hmm. loss? Yes. Is if if you could sum it up and like, hey, do this practical one or two things because. I, I know what we said was uh, true, good, healthy. Um, if we broke it into smaller, more specific nuggets for anyone, is there, is there something that you could offer the audience tonight on how to go about building your life on that rock? What, is that, what does that specifically look for, like for you or for you? Uh, begin believing what you read in the Word of God. That, that's a great place to start. You know, it's one thing to hear it and to nod along and even to highlight a couple of things in your Bible. Begin to believe it, though. Begin to have conversations with the author of the Word. You know, take time to not, not develop a devotional routine, but learn to commune with God. Learn to spend time with Him. Get in His Word. Uh, get in front of Him and begin that conversation, and he'll show you all the reasons he's worthy of your trust, and it makes you more willing to, to build your house there. Amen. Uh, yes. Fully <laughs> agree. Yeah, okay. That, Fair enough. Okay. But we agree. We can, we can prepare. Yeah. We, yes. don't, we don't have to be caught not ready in any of these situations, right? right? And, it, and nothing about preparation says it won't hurt, right? right. We're in agreement there, right? That there will be pain. Okay. All right. So, so in the midst of the loss and that immediate season, the, this processing through that. Um, you brought up something earlier today, Clay, today, Clay as we were talking. You talked about the, somebody wrote about the, the stages of grief and what that's kind of done to our conception of how to process. Can you kind of go yeah, over that? When, when Elizabeth Kubler Ross is her name, she wrote a book called On Death and Dying, and she identified what's been commonly now known as the five stages of grief. And her work was, was really good, but it seemed to package these five stages of grief almost as though they're five steps. And so we, we look at it, if we're not careful, as though it should be a linear process. So we, we go through step one and then we move on to step two and, and so on and so forth. But the steps of grief, the grief are kind of like the weather here in North Carolina. You know, we can experience all the seasons in any given day the same with the steps of grief. You can experience those multiple steps, you know, the, the, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, the acceptance. You can go back and forth. You can skip around. It, it's not just this linear process. So, um, you know, it, how long does the grieving process take? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's one of those things. It, it, it's going to be a process. And so we, we have to understand what it is and we have to allow ourselves to process the grief and we have to allow, allow those around us to process the grief. Yeah, and I think, I think part of that is we will experience significant moments of peace in between those, those moments right. of grief, right? So it'll seem like, man, I'm, I'm over it. Like I'm through it, I got this. And then a song hits the radio or a memory flashes back and it brings you right back. And, and I don't think we should somehow convince ourselves. I think it's unhealthy for us to be like, oh man, I'm failing at this. I'm, I'm not doing this right. This is the natural thing. We're, there's so much that the relationships we have that, that who brought it up earlier? Deep love. Who brought it up? You did. did. You know, the deep grief is the result. It's the consequence mm-hmm. of deep love. Think about it. If, if your neighbor down the street that you don't really know passes away, they die, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have an emotional impact on you. Whereas if it's someone that lives in your own house, that, that, that someone that you have that intimate relationship with, it's going to hurt more. That's, that's just the way it is. You cannot experience love in this world without experiencing love grief. Dan, you had some, uh, some, well, some you verses know, I, here. I think if we agree that we're the people of God, 
um, you know, when we read his word and even some of his promises in the word, we might read those promises a little bit differently, uh, especially when something happens to someone who's near to us, someone that we do love, you know, somebody, someone that we know and that we love, you know, they, they deal with a season of le- grief or, or loss or whatever. And, and so when I, when I read something like we see in Psalm 34, 18, a very familiar passage to most of you, it gets uh, quoted and often and you see it in every social media platform. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Well, the Lord is near the brokenhearted, but if we're the people of the Lord, if we have the Holy Spirit (laughs) living within us, it might be us that does that comforting, you know? We have got to have a firm enough grip on who we are in Christ that we can can mourn with those who are mourning. We can can be joyous with those who who are in a time of joy. But we may need to be those who comfort those who need to be comforted in that moment. It may be as close as your spouse or one of your children, but it may be somebody who you are just a close acquaintance with in, in your church. You know, when, when we see these situations come around, we need to realize that we are the ones who carry the Holy Spirit into those situations and be willing to be that person who, who on the Lord's behalf, is comforting those who are brokenhearted and those, as it says in, in the word, you know, those crushed in spirit. Do you want to touch on the other two at all or no? <laughs> I, I wrote notes. <laughs> and he, now, now he wants me to use them. <laughs> no, I just want to make sure we don't skip anything that is worth it. So. Well, yeah, um, we, we talk, I, I wrote down the journey of healing in, uh, in Psalm 147, uh, verse 3 is uh, the one that I highlighted for that. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. And, and this is true. You know, I, I know, and, and I'm going to have to go back to the same place where, where I started. You know, um, it's how you build your house. You know, when, when, you, when, you, when you know that you're living with the one who created the universe, and when, when you have given your all and you've, you've thrown everything in, and every hat that you have is in the ring, it's easier to trust him and it's easier to, to realize that he does heal the brokenhearted. But and that includes you when, when your heart's broken. But in all this, it, it doesn't mean it won't hurt. It doesn't mean Absolutely. You, won't, you won't miss that, that person. I mean, you know, we think about, especially if you think about you know, the death of a spouse, um, the, the death of a child. You know, th- these things are, are, are major losses that you don't just get over. You, you know, you don't, I, I think about it, even for me, I was just, as we're sitting here, thinking about my grandfather um, passed many, many years ago. Um, well, my 24, 25 years ago. And um, so I still get a little emotional talking about it. It's not that I'm, I'm, I'm hurt by it, but there's still, you know, there, there's, we, we have emotions. And these things can come up out of nowhere. I remember one time about four or five years ago, um, there was a, a family event and there was a cake there. It just happened to be my grandfather's favorite. You know, in, in that moment, I mean, I'm standing here at this, this party, and I, I'm, I'm crying because the, the, the emotion hit. doesn't mean I haven't processed that grief. It doesn't mean that, that, but it was just, you know, we mourn a loss. And then sometimes those things come back up. And it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't mean that I have... I'm questioning whether God is good because I get a little bit emotional <laughs> mm-hmm. over my grandfather passing 25 years ago. It, it just, it is. And I think that's, that's one of the things is we as Christ followers, we have to get comfortable being around those that are grieving. If we really want to be the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth, we've got to get comfortable being around their emotion or their lack of emotion. There's no right or wrong way to, to grieve. There's some wrong things you can do. There are some ways that it can get sidetracked, but you're, so many things affect the way that someone grieves. They're, they're, 
you know, my father. I, I've only, I haven't seen my father cry very often, uh, you know, and, and never around uh, uh, the loss of someone. Hmm. You know, he, he doesn't process his emotions that way. Doesn't mean he doesn't have them. Doesn't mean he doesn't hurt or feel the loss. And, and I, I'm just the opposite. I can cry for, you know, just about anything. You know, I, th- but we have to be comfortable and sometimes we have to be comfortable being quiet around their grief. Hmm. And, we'll, and we'll get there too. Yeah. So, okay. So we'll, we'll move on to uh, uh, finishing well. So um, I think it's good to acknowledge, right, that this is a season. This is a time. There is a time for grief and for loss and for mourning and for weeping. But that season comes to an end. Spring follows winter, right? And so we want to be able to finish well. Uh, We want to make sure that we don't find ourselves perpetually in this season of loss and grief, and we don't know how to escape. And so um, we we want to set ourselves up to do that well. One of those, I would say, one of the things we can do, again, believing the word, uh, right? Having great faith in that. Um, But knowing that Trusting that the person or the people that you've lost wouldn't want you and your father in heaven wouldn't want you wasting every day following that, wallowing in that, that pain and in that, in that, uh, what would have eventually become self-pity, right? So, so how do you guys have any tips for how do we finish well? How, how, how do we set ourselves up to successfully come out of that season fully? Um, I, I told you I was going to say this. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was. That's my. It's your in, turn. Like, part of the no. conversation. Um, I don't. I don't know how you finish well. Okay. Um, I, I know how you keep moving well, though. You know, I, I ran into somebody. I didn't. I want to bring personal stuff into this, but I, I ran into somebody in in the foyer before the service, and he said, "What do you guys talk about tonight?" And I told him. He's like, hmm. "And," <laughs> but. He, he said, well, you know, you guys seem to handle things pretty well. I'm thinking, you, you, saw, you saw the handling well. You didn't see the other moments, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think, I think it, it changes. You know, when, when we deal with heavy stuff, eventually we get used to lifting heavy things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you, you, you build... You build this strength and you, you, you get a new momentum in your life as you walk through these things. And again, being those people who build their lives around Christ, you begin to recognize the, the need in other people around you. And, you. and you begin to realize that that the experience that you had is not isolated to only you. It's going on all over the world, all at the same time right in your neighborhood, right in your church, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in your uh, um, uh, near distant uh, family members. And you learn how to give that strength to others. You learn how to help other people train and how to help other people um, get stronger and stay stronger as they walk through situations, you know. But um, as, as we had that conversation out there, I would quickly, something came back to mind. And I thought, you know, you saw me, me walking through everything and muscling through things, but you didn't see, you know, when uh, I was home and, and I was thinking, man, I've got such a weight. I don't feel like I could even stand up, you know, uh, because grief is a heavy thing. When, when you lose people that are close to you, um, and, and, and most of you here uh, have probably experienced that, and for those of you who haven't, We'll be praying for you when it happens because we, we know it hurts and we know it's heavy. Uh, and w- there are many of us who are dealing with that even today, you know, and, and we're in different stages uh, of grief, you know, because it's not some linear process. It's something that will come, like you said, you know, a, a song comes on the radio and you're like, man, perfect time. And I was, you know, <laughs> but finishing well has to do with, with living well all the way through, you know, about, about recognizing that what we have, just like any other level of our discipleship, you know, you know, we're this living deep series talking about the, the book of first John and John was so, so emphatic about everything. He, he wanted people to get and to understand what he understood. When, when we realize the strength that we have, even in the midst of these things, and man, why would we not want to share that? That's finishing well, taking what we've been given and giving it to someone else. 
Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, finishing well is, is it's part of that process. It's, it's, it's realizing that the, the, the loss does not change God's call or his plan for you. Mm. And so, therefore, you have a responsibility to, to him to, to carry on, to, to keep moving forward. Sometimes that finishing well is just taking the next step with the determination that you're going to take the step after, <coughs> after that. Because the stage of de- grief, if, if you want to look at it that way, that most people get stuck in is depression. And, and so they, that depression leads to they don't take that next step. They don't, they don't keep moving forward. Even if, it's, even if it's small steps, you know, we, there's no way to say, okay, you're done. You, you've, you've finished, you're through grieving, and now you can move on with your life. Because it's not really about moving on with your life. If these people were, if this person, if we're talking about a loss, you know, if it's your spouse or it's your child, th- th- your child, they made an impact on you. And it, it's not something that you just leave in the past. It's yeah. something that, that, that carries with you. And, you know, Dan, I think you, you brought up a good point earlier when we were talking, you know, you are talking about using their name. You know, and, and I know that's in, in talking with others, but I think that's important that we, we not be afraid to name the, the person that, that, that was lost. Yeah, pretending that... Yeah, they didn't somehow erasing them from memory. In fact, when I encounter uh, people in this season in their life when they've lost someone, my prayer is is almost always going to be including the request that they would have access to all the memories, all the all those fun times, every, everything that made that relationship powerful and rewarding to them, that they would be able to reach back into that into that um, that that basket of all those memories and and fully experience those and the joy that came with those as often and as, nece- as necessary for them. Uh, but when it comes to finishing well, I'm kind of reminded of David when we see him with, as he, he spends this week praying for his child who God told him, I'm going to take this child from you. And he spends, he's, he's not taking care of himself. He's, he's not sleeping well. He's, he's in prayer and he is begging for the child, the child's life. And then he gets news that the child is gone and, and so now, like, it, it, it is so abrupt for him. And I'm not saying this is the magic recipe for everybody, but his faith in God was so strong. Like, well, now that child is with the Lord. You know, like, I don't need to pray for him to come back from the dead. I know who he's with now. And so now I'll get up and I'll take care of myself and, you know, please fix me some food and, and I'll go about. I mean, he had responsibilities. He was the king. So he had things to do. And so I don't, I don't think that, and in finishing well, that we would, we should imagine that there is, this is the one path to successfully grieving. Um, but we just want to stay away from really unhealthy things. And we need to recognize that there is, there is a time to come out and, and experience joy after that season. And we, we can, and we, and we should do that. So I want to talk about the flip side of this, the we've, we're seeing others experiencing grief. We're not the primary griever in the moment. The, the beauty and the necessity of coming together, um, we were kind of talking about this conversation uh, but like no, 6 o'clock tonight, just talking about you know, what would we discuss. And uh, man, I, I can't even talk about the beauty of what we have here, the family, the community that exists here without getting a little choked up, a little emotional. The, the, it's so amazing. And, and we have this. And so when we see somebody go through a loss, we are here for them. They are here for us, and we need to use that. We need to come together. We need to not make it about ourselves, right? So we need to know, like, um, we need to know that even though we are full in, we are, I'm here for you, bro, they may find the connection with somebody else in that time of grieving, and we need to be okay with that, right? But we we should, we should be ready to connect as a body. There's a gap in their relationships. And while we'll never take that person's place, 
there's still a relationship hole in that person. And they're going to connect. They need to connect with somebody. And this church body, who would be better than within the church body to be that connection? And so I think we, we should set ourselves up for that. We, we should commit to that. And we can do it um, pretty specifically, too. Real quick, I want to... See, Romans 12, 15 here says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So even in the, the grieving process, we can grieve with them too. We can, you know, that, that shoulder to shoulder time that's talked about um, in marriage conferences that, that men need in this grieving season that pe- sometimes people just need a shoulder to shoulder person. They, they just need somebody to say, man, I, I want to go outside and throw some rocks in the water. I, I want to, can I, can we just get together, take my mind off something and play some guitars, Wh- whatever it may be. And so um, we can make ourselves available. I think we should make ourselves available and we shouldn't take offense as somebody's going through those stages of grief, bouncing around in those different stages when they don't, they're not ready for it. Or then when they're connecting with somebody else. Um, and sometimes we need to recognize, right, that maybe we're just not the best person for it. Maybe right. we don't have the, we don't have the season, the seasoning from our lives that, that makes us the best person to counsel them through that. And we don't always have to provide counsel either. We, <laughs> we talked about the whole platitudes yes. thing earlier, right? So we want to support well, right? So we don't just want to say, Hey, I'm here for you. Right. Uh, we were, we were kind of, uh, in our Saturday morning discussion, uh, this last week, we, we got together and, and one of our brothers has experienced a loss and, and he had seen overwhelming support through, through a large text thread of men saying, we're here for you, we're here for you, hit me up if you need me, right? And in the, in the days following that, we, me, he and I had bumped into each other and he's like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed, but I'm so appreciative and God is so good. He's given me these brothers in this season I don't want to over ask. I want to know what I can ask for. What's appropriate? How do I go about doing that? So we just sat in the room and I said, guys, can we just, can we just tell them what we're here for? Can we just, instead of saying I'm here for you, like, bro, if, if you need me to come over for dinner and just so you don't eat alone, I'm not, I'm your guy. If you want me to help you cook, I'm your guy. You want to go play guitars? I'm your guy. Like whatever you're specifically available for, make it a little easier for that person. And again, not taking offense. They may not be ready for that. They may not need what you have to offer. And that's, that's a good thing, right? But that we would just say, you know what? Not only am I here, I'm here specifically for this. I'm here for some shoulder to shoulder, shoulder time, right? And so we want to position ourselves to support them in that grieving well. You guys have any and and don't underestimate the power of just a text message you know so many times we we somebody comes across our mind that you know god puts them on our heart and it's wonderful to stop and pray for them in that moment but you know i've I've had it multiple times where i run into somebody and say you know i was really thinking about you the other day and they start telling me about what they were going through at that moment on that day and it God didn't put them on my heart and my mind for me to think about them and say a prayer for them. He put them on my, my heart and my mind to just reach out, to just say, hey, hey, how are things going? Or, hey, man, we love you guys and we're praying for you. And, and just, just those simple words. Don't hit them with the, with the platitudes of, you know, we see them all the time. But just, just, hey, I love you and I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do for you today? That can be powerful because it, it, it gives them permission to ask. Sometimes, I mean, most of us, especially men, we don't like to ask for help. But if we're given permission to ask, it makes it a little easier. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we've kind of gone through a season in the church, not Rockfish Church, in the church, where we... we we don't really have Sunday school. We don't have groups that get together. We don't have pastors who go, go visit people on s- Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon. But as, as we saw those things go away in the name of um, modernism, as a, as a, as a, in, in what may be a practical thing in relationship to the culture, we didn't replace it with anything. You know, so there is still personal connection that's missing and you know if if we believe in the power of fellowship if we believe truly that we are one body that we're unified we need to be building that body we need to be 
getting close to the people who are here in fellowship with us, understanding where the weaknesses are and, and where our strengths lie and where the strengths of those around us lie so that when we do come into any season, whether it's, whether it's a, 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 a loss through death or whether it's just a, a difficult season, we, through the power of fellowship and the power of understanding where other people are, that we are able to lean in and help, you know, to be supported people and to support well, like, like we're talking about here. Amen. All right, so we got, we got four minutes just in case something came to mind that we didn't discuss when it comes to this topic. Do you have any closing recommendations for, the guy, for everybody tonight? I just one of those things that, that we can know and we can stand on. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Paul's talking about the thorn in the flesh. And, and it said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. That, that's, that's it. His grace is sufficient. Sometimes I'll, you look at somebody and go, I don't know how they can go through what they're going through. I do. Because his grace is sufficient. I don't have the grace to walk through that circumstance at this moment because God's not asking me to walk through it. But if he's having them walk through it, guess what? His grace is sufficient. So whether it's your season of loss or somebody else's season of loss. We can stand on that truth that no matter what, his grace is sufficient. A couple things. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, Eric, uh, the conversation that, that we were having um, with someone who dealing with loss. And, and what stuck with me was what came out of that conversation. Um, you know, the, 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 the person was clearly saying, I don't know that I have permission to ask for help. And he didn't know what to, what to ask for because he didn't know what the boundaries were. But the people didn't know how to help because they didn't know what he needed. And what came out of that were some very specific needs. And people around the room began hearing the, these needs and realizing where they could fill that need, something that they had. So what happened there was through this open conversation, through this moment of fellowship, this bridge got built. You know, and, and suddenly fellowship happened. Suddenly support was there. You know, it, it was very, um, it was very powerful a few moments. And, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't some big grand conversation. It was just real people being real with other real people. You know, and, and another, if, and, and you alluded to this earlier, but if you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's dealing with uh, a great loss, um, um, somebody they loved deeply, don't be afraid to say their name around that person. You know, I, I can recall our situation one more time. This, I started to bring something personal in again, but, um, you know, I came home and we, we have this chalkboard, you know, the kind where you write the menu or you, a note that you want your spouse to see or whatever. And I came home and I wrote, his name is Chris. Because people would dance around it so much, they would, you know, like they were going to, they were going to mess me up if they if they uh, spoke the name. Man, when you love deeply, it's okay if other people mention that they mention that person by name because, like you said, you know, it's it's from that place that we find these great memories. You know, where where we're able to go back to those good places. And so, if if you're dealing with somebody who's dealing with great loss, don't be afraid to be a not just a friend, but a, a close friend who, who's not afraid to, to go there. Be real. Awesome. And I just want to say uh, thank you both for, you know, reaching into your, your own experience here. I'm a, I, I don't have as much, so thank you guys for that. Um, again, guys, I, I don't want us as a body of believers to, to fear this topic, to fear that season, and to um, somehow start to blame God or, or think that something's going wrong. Like this, this is, death is a, is a stage. It's a season of life. It's something we have to go through. We can't get to the next one without passing through that gate. And if we truly believe what we said, like Dan said, if we, if we, if we, if we force ourselves to believe it, if we, if we continually ask ourselves, do I believe this? I think we'll find that we are in a better place and being able to trust that word, his promise, 
and for that, that eternal life that he's offered and we'll receive it. And, and we'll be able, to, in that receiving it, we'll be able to live out this life so much better. We won't have to tiptoe through. We won't, we won't have to worry about um, all, the, all the, the, the fears, the anxieties of, of missing out on something. Uh, we can live this life fully. Um, there's a, a, another portion of Ecclesiastes it's in there a couple times in Ecclesiastes where it talks about that it is good. Like, look, everything we're doing here in this life is futile and all the more reason to live this life fully, to, to eat and drink and to be made full of joy often, as often as you can be, especially because you might get caught off guard one day and be robbed of any more chances to enjoy somebody else, especially because you've been given the warning shot across the bow that you've got three to six months or you've got one to two years with somebody. How much, how foolish do we have to be to not turn that into the best months and years of our life with that person? And to, and to strengthen that relationship so there'd be more memories to go back to and a greater celebration of life when we gather as a memorial service. That, that's what our intention should be, is to live this life fully because we believe there's the next one. And that's, that's what I hope we would do here as a, as a family, a body of believers, that we would live this one fully because we trust that one. And then all of a sudden we realize that sting that sting that death had for us is no longer there. I think that's, a, that's a, a good approach for us. And I hope each one of us can experience it better, if not fully, than we, better than we have been. So um, that being said, either one of you want to pray us out? Father God, we do thank you for the time that we have to be together, to be together as family, as fellow believers, as fellow followers. I pray that you would strengthen us through whatever season that we're in. Father, let us rejoice when it's time to rejoice. Let us mourn and mourn together when it's time to mourn. But let us live fully for you. Let us be about building our house on the rock, on the foundation you've provided. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.